excuse me. Uh, this is Mr. McMurray. Okay, uh, we're here for the scientific uh, method notes, okay? And um, so we're going to talk about this a little bit. First of all, scientific method. Uh, you've probably heard that and steps of it, some of it, but we're going to kind of go over a little bit where all that came from. The first thing we're going to talk about is the word science itself. The word science literally means to know. It should be on the screen. All right, there it is. Okay, literally it means to know. In other words, uh, how do we know that something is right? The idea of science was people started looking around and saying, hey, we need to know that something's true or not. How can we prove that? Uh, many of the first people wanted to just sit around and argue about it. The Greeks and Romans, uh, they had philosophers, and they would sit around and discuss things, but rather than actually check it out. For example, one time they were famous for having argued about how many teeth had to be in the mouth of a horse, Okay, but no one thought to go and actually count the number of teeth in a horse Okay, and doing it some practical way of figuring it out. They just wanted to discuss why it would have this many or that many teeth and, and so forth. So um, science came about as a way of, hey, how can we find out what is really true or not? And, and it has to do with making measurements and trying to, uh, so it's not just an opinion or an idea, but some way that I can prove that this is what happens, okay? And so that's the idea behind science to begin with. All right. And so the method that we use for that is called the scientific method. Now, it didn't come about all at once. It was a little bit over time. Uh, different people added to it. Uh, but basically, it's a method of solving problems or trying to find a uh, new information, finding out something we didn't already know. So uh, basically, that's usually what we're trying to do. We're either trying to solve a problem. How can we make a car that has better gas mileage? Or trying to find out new information about, say, the ocean. We want to find out more about the animals or plants or whatever that grow in the ocean or the rainforest or, or somewhere else, okay? Or how do they behave, uh, mating behavior of a certain uh, animal, whatever. Something we want to find out about it, okay? Now, really, if you just think of this as problem solving, you will hear problem solving uh, in all kinds of places. Uh, a counselor's office, you come in, she says, okay, let's find out what's the problem, what's going on, find out information about it. Then she'll say, okay, let's talk about possibilities. You pick an option. Let's try this. Say you're not getting along with your best friend. Uh, why don't you try doing this, okay? And then you go out. You try it. You see if it works or not. You come back and talk it over with the counselor. Did that work? Did it improve things? No. Then let's try something else, okay? And then eventually, hopefully, you come to a conclusion of something that does help and solves your problem, okay? And that could be, like I said, a personal problem with a friend, with a counselor. It could be whatever. But anytime we're trying to solve a problem, that's really using the scientific method, all right? Now... So we're starting with some kind of a problem or something we want to know about. So basically a how can we do this or why does this happen uh, or what would happen if, that sort of thing. We've got something that we want to check into, okay? All right, and so that's where um, first step. Now, once we find out a problem, uh, it may be that someone has already found the answer to it, okay? Say, for example, I find a snake, and I don't know for sure what the snake eats. I might have a guess based on... Uh, where I found it, or uh, how big it is, or what I know about snakes in the past. I've had other snakes. Uh, but I could probably look up somewhere, if I can figure out what kind of snake it is, I could look up on the internet or in a field guide, and I might be able to find out the information right there. And so that is doing research, okay? And research is just searching for information that's already discovered. If somebody has already answered your question, then you may not need to do research. Uh, maybe I will I'll find some research that says, well, this snake in the eastern United States eats this, this, and this. Uh, baby rabbits, mice, and um, lizards. Okay? Now, I may decide that, well, that's probably good enough, and I've already got my information, so I, I, I'll just try that. Okay? But it may be that maybe the same kind of animals don't live where I am. Maybe we don't have as many lizards. And so... Lizards aren't really an option for me, so I might try something else, okay? So sometimes you can do research and find the answer to your question. Sometimes you may not and may have to still do some, your own uh, research on it. But if someone else has already answered your question, you may not need to do any more after that. Some of the ways you can do research are written materials, okay? Uh, books, records uh, that are kept and filed somewhere. Um, you can, and nowadays we would include the internet and things like that, although once again you should always be careful on the internet. Uh, Wikipedia is uh, pretty reliable, for example, uh, government publications 
uh, are usually fairly reliable as long as they're not being uh, altered by politicians uh, and things like that. So, uh, but as well as books, magazines, whatever, uh, all ma books and magazines and internet sites are not equal to all others. Some are more authoritative or more trustable than others, but uh, those are ways you can find out information. You could ask somebody, maybe I know a game warden that lives down the street or a uh, wildlife biologist or science teacher. Really, I could ask them and they might be able to tell me what my snake would eat as a way of doing research. And last but not least, maybe just my past experience. Maybe I've had other snakes before and based on the size of this or that, I think this one will probably eat this, okay? So uh, it could be just based on my past experience I come up with uh, an answer to my question, all right? So these are all ways of doing research. Um, we, it could be, for example, that Mr. McMurray is an axe murderer. Yes, I know that's kind of shocking there, but it could be. Uh, we'd like to assume that the school checked that all out, but let's just say that Mr. McMurray, you read on social media that Mr. McMurray is a, might be an axe murderer. What are some ways you could do research to figure out if that's true or not? Well, there's written materials. You could look for uh, birth certificates. Of course, they probably didn't have a picture, and it didn't look like I do now, so you're not sure it's the same one. They'd both be bald, but other than that, you can be sure. Um, but there's there's those. You could take uh, job history, resume, check references, stuff like that. That kind of goes and ask somebody, maybe uh, family members who could keep track of me and know, yeah, this is the same guy that it used to be. Of course, that wouldn't necessarily prove that I was an axe murderer or not, but that might give some more credence to the fact that, yes, I'm just a teacher, science teacher, not actually an axe murderer. And you could go over your past experiences, which has only been a couple weeks probably, but, you know, do I really act like a axe murderer? That's not 100% proof, but it might give you an idea. Uh, of course, every time they do arrest a serial killer, serial killer or an axe murderer, you know there's always the neighbors that say, he seemed like such a nice person, or she seemed like such a nice person. Uh, so, you know, it's obviously, once again, not proof, but uh, anyhow. So uh, those are ways that you could use research on that. Just for the record, Mr. McMurray is not an axe murderer. Of course, if I was, isn't that what I would tell you? Exactly. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? All right. So those are ways of doing research. Now, if you don't find an answer, or at least not an answer that you trust enough that you think you're ready to go with that, then you may want to come up with your own hypothesis or your own idea of how, how to solve the problem or what to feed the snake or whatever. And that is called a hypothesis. Key thing about a hypothesis, it's, a, it's untested. Okay. Sometimes it's called an educated guess. Well, educated means you know what you're talking about. Guess means you're just taking a stab at it. You don't know. Um, so I don't like that word because it's kind of an oxymoron, kind of like jumbo shrimp. Jumbo means big, shrimp means little. It's kind of like, okay. But um, we're going to go with an untested explanation uh, of how something works or maybe a prediction. Here's what I think will happen if we do this. Or a solution. I think this would work if we if solve our problem if we did this, okay? But the key word is you have not tried it out, so it is completely untested at this point. All right. Now, to test it, we need to come up with some kind of an experiment. If it's not testable, if there's no way to test it, okay, um, then that doesn't do us any good. So, for example, if I said that Tim McGraw is a better country and western singer than George Strait, um, or uh, Luke Bryan or whoever, uh, or you could plug in whatever pop group, there's really no way to test that. You could see who's more popular, take a survey of people here and see how many people like each one of them, but you can't really prove that. You can't test it and prove that one is more a better singer than the other one. Uh, a lot of that is opinion. So it has to be something that's testable, that you can come up with an experiment that will test it. Okay, And so... Uh, anytime we do an experiment, there are variables, things that can be changed, okay, conditions that can be changed, or varied. Varied means to change, so if it's a variable, it's something that can be changed, all right? So say, for example, we want to grow some tomato plants, all right? And we want to grow tomato plants, and so we have a tomato plant. So what are some of the things that we could change about that to make it grow better and more tomatoes? Well, we could give it extra water, we could give it a uh, different kind of fertilizer, different kind of fertilizer might be better, more fertilizer, uh, figure out the right level, too much might kill it, maybe we got to find the right amount. Um, does it get rainwater? Does it get water from the tap? Uh, various things like that. Spraying it with chemicals to kill the bugs, is that going to help? All right, all those are things that we could change about the tomato plant, okay? Let's just go with 
eh, fertilizer's sake, guano, bat guano, why not? Uh, bat guano, which is just basically bat droppings. Very high nitrogen, supposed to be a good thing. So we're going to put that. So we put that on a plant, and we also give it extra water. And it grows lots of tomatoes. It gets 40 tomatoes per plant. Now, if we give it extra water and we gave it bat guano fertilizer, can we say that the bat guano fertilizer is what made it get bigger? Can we say that the water made it get bigger? Not for sure. So, generally, when we do an experiment, we only want to change uh, one variable at a time, okay? That way, uh, we will know uh, what caused the change. If we just give it bat guano and it gets uh, really big and puts lots of tomatoes, then we know the bat guano did it. If we water it extra, but if we know that caused it. But if we, if we do both, we don't know for sure if which one caused it or did both of them cause it. Uh, you need both of them to do that. And so generally we try to change one variable at a time. That's very difficult to do with people because people have so many different variables on what they eat, where they live, how long they sleep, and, and a whole bunch of things that are going to affect their health. Uh, it's one thing for a rat in a cage. You can control almost everything except the variable that you're trying to change. But that doesn't work so well uh, with people because there's so much variation in people. So what we usually try to do with people, we try to get two big groups, and hopefully the big groups will cover so many different kinds of people that all the differences will kind of average out. Okay, and sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not. We try to get different age groups, we try to get male and female, we try to get different races, people with different conditions, uh, other conditions that might affect, say, this medicine we're going to give them, whatever, uh, and things like that. But we want to change one variable. So let's say we're going to pick bat guano. So we are going to put bat guano on the tomato plant. It gets big and it makes 40 tomatoes. Did it help to put back guano in it? Well, we don't know because how much would it have grown if there were no back guano on it? Okay? Uh, we need something to compare it to. So, the one with the back guano is called our experimental group. It's the group in which the variable has changed. We change the amount of fertilizer and how much and what kind it is. It's back guano. That's the experimental group. But we also need a group that doesn't have back guano, okay, or a control group the group that has not been changed, okay? And that way we can say, okay, the one without bat guano only got 20 tomatoes per plant. The one with bat guano got 40. Now can we say that it helped? Yes. Obviously we got a lot more tomatoes when we added bat guano than we did on the plants that did not have bat guano. Okay, so in that case we can say, yes, it definitely made a difference because we can compare it to the plants that did not have the bat guano. All right? So we need just a basic group. Now, if we're doing this with medicine and people, then uh, we would have to have people who don't get the medicine and people who do get the medicine. And not only that, but we don't want to tell them whether they're getting the medicine. We both give both of them a tablet to take. One of them has medicine in it and one of them doesn't. And we don't tell them which one is which because that way they don't convince themselves that they're feeling better. Oh, I think I feel better. Don't you think I feel better? Okay. Uh, you, people are, are known for being able to talk themselves into... Um, deciding that they do feel better or not if they know they're getting the medicine. So we do what we call a blind test where um, they don't know for sure. In fact, sometimes even the people giving them, the doctor who's evaluating whether they're better off or not, doesn't know. Okay, Somebody needs to know because we got to know who we actually gave the medicine to and who we didn't. But because the same thing can happen with the doctor. If he sees so-and-so, I, yeah, I know he's getting the medicine, and I think he's looking better. Okay, you can kind of talk yourself into that or bias yourself uh, by that. And so um, that's why we need to have a control group, and we need to have a um, – sometimes we don't even let the patient know or even the doctor know uh, whether they're actually getting the treatment or if they're just getting like a sugar pill or something uh, because that can res affect our results. All right. And that is part one of the scientific method notes. We will come back for part two at a future date, probably after the holiday. Have a good long weekend, and don't forget to answer the questions on this.